Well, good morning. I feel like I should begin by uh, reminding you of the always true adage that you should not believe everything you hear. (laughs) When uh, Dean York got up to describe things you did not know about me, I made a signal to the audiovisual folks to disconnect <laughs> the cable. It, uh, it didn't work. But I refuse to be slandered in such a way. <laughs> I need new duties. Yes, actually, uh, I, 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 I do not do any imitation of Napoleon Dynamite. It would be far too humiliating because I was Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, <laughs> if you were to go back into the 1970s, which is a, 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 an awkward decade in itself, uh, I, I, I hesitate when I look at the high school yearbook because I recognize I was a movie star uh, before it was cool. I'm not sure it ever has been cool, but I look at those pictures and I realize, yes, I was Napoleon Dynamite. It is so good to be here with you this morning. It's it's good to be here in this chapel service. It's good to be able to sing together, a mighty fortress is our God. It's wonderful to be able to be confronted by Scripture together, and and it's it's just good to, to be here in a service on the eve of Halloween, on the eve of All Hallows' Eve. And remember, first and foremost, the 501st anniversary of the Reformation. It's a, it was just a year ago that we were, we were celebrating that 500-year mark of the Reformation. And, and here we are, just as committed, 501 years later, to the great theological truths that were recovered and restated with the hope and promise of a church reformed in the 16th century and now. The society around us does celebrate, however, Halloween. And it has become now one of the largest commercial holidays in the United States. This is, if you were a Marxist, you would look at Halloween and you would say, this is just how capitalism works. You you begin with something that, uh, that, that, that is just organic and, and local. Uh, you, you begin with, uh, w- 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 with a Victorian recapturing of the idea of children dressing on All Hallows' Eve uh, to go out on what would be called Halloween and go trick-or-treating. And, and before you know it, it is a massive consumerist holiday. We are told in the top four of all spending that will go on on all American holidays during this year, Halloween now ranks so near the top that that it is a massive expenditure of billions of dollars. Now, there's a history to it. I've written quite a bit about this. I've talked about it on the briefing, the... uh, the basic pagan history to Halloween, and, and, and there was, there was a, always a, a sense of paganism behind it. There was always a sense of something spiritually very dangerous behind Halloween, a, a, a sense of a fascination with evil. Uh, uh, one night uh, celebrating, and, and, you know, the, the dark side. And, and then, of course, uh, there have been the, the festivals that have been alongside Halloween from the very beginning that have been not just historically pagan, but explicitly pagan, and more so now with the resurgence of paganism of all things in the 21st century, it turns out that a secular society won't stay secular. Just as nature abhors a vacuum, so also does the human soul. And in a society that has increasingly turned its back on Christianity, new forms of paganism and new age spirituality and all kinds of nonsense are are, are now flooding such that we we have uh, headline news and so many major newspapers about gatherings of witches for this and for that. I I was just recently in a bookstore, uh, one of the the rather successful independent bookstores in this country, only to discover that that there was a witches meeting going on in the bookstore. That that presents a challenge for the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. What what exactly do you do? I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be Elijah or uh, 
or what exactly should take place when you notice the sign that witches are meeting therein. Uh, I decided an exit was the, uh, was the most appropriate response uh, for the president of the seminary, lest there be any confusion uh, by remaining in the bookstore. There's always been something incongruous to me about this. I, I was a teenager in the 1970s, and the 1970s were in American popular culture when there was a significant turn in, in the way movies were made and tales were told. This, this was when Stephen King's literature began to gain traction in the United States, and there was a shift in movies. It was a shift towards greater darkness, more explicit violence, indeed horrifying violence, violence that never would have been tolerated on the big screen or, for that matter, in American literature in previous eras. It, it emerged in the 1970s and beyond, and then has exploded into an entire industry of horror. I've never even quite understood it psychologically. I mean, I can't explain it as, uh, again, a, a confused society, a secular society, developing a fascination with, with evil precisely because of its theological confusion. I can understand that. I can understand the allure of, of, of wanting to, to give a, a, a fleeting glimpse to the dark side. I can understand that. That's a seduction, a temptation that's identified even in Scripture. What I don't understand is buying a ticket, or for that matter, buying a ticket and taking your girlfriend into a movie where you know you're going to eat popcorn and you're going to come out at the end and go home. And in the meantime... You, you suspend your disbelief in order to enter into an experience in which you are to be scared out of your wits. But here's the amazing thing, it works. I have no interest in those movies, but I, 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 and I really don't. I really don't. I, I, my dad, my dad we grew up, uh, of course, in the 1930s and 40s, and and he told me that the most traumatic experience of his life was when he was seven, seven. He got home, his mother had a migraine headache, she sent him to the movie theater at seven. He walked down to the, the center of this little town in the south and walked into the movie theater and saw a matinee of Bambi. <laughs> Bambi. But when the forest fire scene came, he couldn't take it and he ran out of the theater and ran all the way home crying because of the horror movie, Bambi. <laughs> now there's an entirely different dimension we could talk about here, which is Disney's domestication of a story that is genuinely more complex and it's genuinely more scary, but not in its animated version. But I basically am my father. I have no desire uh, to go in order to be scared in a movie theater much less the celebration that goes beyond merely being scared of violence and mayhem and worse. And besides that, I've read the Bible. And brothers and sisters, that's quite scary enough. I, I want to preach this morning about the scariest thing in the world. And I, I, I mentioned this on social media yesterday, and sure enough, I, I got some interesting responses about what the scariest thing in the world might be. And uh, because it is a sermon, and they knew it was going to be preached in chapel, they, they didn't come immediately to some kind of, of natural uh, uh, explanation such that it would be a great white shark or a grizzly bear uh, or a tornado or a hurricane. No, no they, they went to something deeper than that, and they said, oh, it's going to be Satan. Well, that's a, that would be a very good candidate for a sermon about the scariest thing in the world. Uh, we, the scripture tells us that he roams to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And, 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 and someone else said, no, uh, I, I, I bet it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's going to be about sin. Well, in, in some sense, yes, it, it is going to be about sin. But not sin as just some, si some kind of, 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 of deep threat. They say, well, maybe it's the wrath of God. Well, there's nothing scarier in the sense of understanding the holiness and the righteousness of God and the judgment that is to come than the wrath of God poured out upon sin. Some churches, as you know, uh, again, going back now a couple of decades, have decided to use Halloween as an evangelistic opportunity by 
creating some kind of fright house. And, and the, the news media are, uh, are captivated by this and appalled by this. And uh, you know, the, the, you get teenagers, they're primarily four teenagers, and you get them in a church, and, and, and it's our southern, uh, our, our evangelical, our, our Christian way of trying to do something genuinely scary. And of course, the problem is we can't do scary like Hollywood can do scary. And, and besides that, we get preachy about our scary. And, and so you've got room one, which is a teenager killed by drunk driving. And, and uh, then you get the drunk driving message while you're in room one. And then you go into room two, and it's drugs. And you, you just go through all this. And by the end of it, you know, they, they then present the gospel and report how many people have come to Christ because they were scared out of their wits. And, and we're, uh, we're led in some kind of formulaic response at the end. I'm not saying that no sinner has ever entered into such a fright house and, uh, and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm just saying it falls what to me is the Apostle Paul test. WWPD, what would Paul do? I just cannot imagine a fright house in Philippi. I think, it just does just, just not work. I don't see the Apostle Paul giving his apostolic sanction uh, to such a methodology. That given the world, the flesh, and the devil, given the holiness of God and the wrath that will be outpoured upon sin, given, given the reality of all of, of the dark side, all of the honesty in God's revealed word about evil and death and, and judgment and all of the enemies of humanity. There would be any number of candidates for the scariest thing in the world, but I want to suggest to you that the scariest thing in the world is you. For me, the scariest thing in the world, it's me. I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Paul writes, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. That it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. This is God's word. It is a haunting word. As we shall see, it turns into a hopeful word. But first, it is a, an indicting word. 
If you were to ask me my favorite city in the world, I think I would answer the same way just about every time. I'm a very proud American, but my favorite city in the world is London. And there, there's something about London that has captivated me long before I was able to be there, and I've been there many times, and, 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 and no number of times will be enough. London's a city where every few feet you, 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 you mark something new, and it's new to you because it's very old. It's one of those few cities in the world where everywhere you step, there is, there is history to be seen, a story to be retold. It was for so many years the most important city in the world, and in many ways it continues to be one of the most important cities of the world. So much of our literature in the English-speaking world by no accident comes from London. So much of our history, our shared history as well, one of the things I love about London are the, are the squares. Uh, London is a great metropolitan city with an enormous wealth coming uh, into London and representing London, especially during the 18th and 19th centuries. It was, it was during the 18th century that London, after the great fire of previous years, had, had begun to rebuild, and it rebuilt in, the, in these elegant squares where the person's able to live in, in, in these squares in London. They built these opulent homes, and in London, they're, they're, they're townhomes. They come, they come right up to the street, and, and there are these beautiful classical facades, and behind them are these grand homes, and and, and so the squares are just, they're just front after front after front. And so you would have four different angles of these beautiful homes made of, made of stone and, and marble and, and brick. This is where the wealthiest of the wealthy would have lived, and their carriages would have dropped them off at the front door. And when they held their, their soirees and their, their elegant parties, and when they gave dinner, which was, a, of course, a multi-course, multi-hour event, the carriages would, would unload their, their occupants. They would go into the front door, and the, and the front door would lead you into these elegant drawing rooms. What, one of the homes in, in one of the most historic of the squares there in London what, was the home of a physician by the name of Dr. John Hunter. And uh, Dr. Hunter is one of the most important figures in the history of medicine. We have a, we have a great deal to thank Dr. Hunter for. It was, it was Dr. Hunter who uh, first actually came to an understanding of the, of the role of the placenta in human development and gestation uh, in the womb and explained how exactly the, the growing child in the womb is nourished by the mother through the placenta. It was he who, who helped to... Uh, to come up with, uh, with modern germ theory as we know it today, at least being able to trace uh, epidemics uh, to contamination. And of course, this is in a day when because of, uh, a, of a, a basic respect for the body, autopsies were not done. Uh, there, there, there was very little knowledge of exactly how the human body worked. And and claiming a, 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 a Christian concern for respect for the body, it was considered a criminal act to, uh, to, to do an investigation on a dead human body. And so th those investigations were, were done in secret. And of course, in, in order to conduct those investigations, those autopsies, those vivisections, you, you, would, you, you, you would have to have a body. And that required stealing a body. There was no provision for someone to leave their bodies to science. There was not even a provision for an autopsy in the case of a criminal investigation. The only way to gain these bodies was to use those who were called resurrection men. Don't read any theology into it. It was merely a crude way of speaking of grave robbers. They would go to graves, especially of executed criminals or others that no one would miss, and the, the resurrection men, the grave robbers, they would steal the bodies and, and then they would sell them to those brave and, uh, and illicit souls who were conducting medical experiments. Dr. John Hunter was one of them. And uh, I, I was reminded of him just a few years ago when I was walking in this square. I wasn't looking for Dr. John Hunter, but one of the marvelous things about London are the medallions, the historic medallions. They're often painted blue, and then they have the writing on them. They're embedded into the walls of buildings, such as the houses, and you can walk square by square and discover who lived here and, and, and who lived there. And I, I just happened to pass a, the, the, a medallion on a beautiful square in central London, and the medallion said this was the home 
of Dr. John Hunter, one of the founding fathers of modern medicine, and my blood turned cold. When Dr. John Hunter died, they discovered that behind the elegant facade of his home, there, there was a back part of the house. And the back part of the house was walled off so that it, 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 was, it was not even perceptible to the people who would come to his elegant parties. He was such an esteemed physician that the wealthiest of the wealthy, the most elite of the elite in London, including members of the royal family, sought him as an attending physician. And, 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 and thus his social life was very important and, and those dinner parties were, were crucial. And, and no one could know what was going on behind what everyone thought was the back wall. But accessible only by an alley, the resurrection men had for a long time been bringing bodies into the back area of Dr. John Hunter's house. And after the dinner was over, Dr. John Hunter would change clothes. He would get out of his, out of, out of his clothes, as you would know from Regency or, or later Victorian England. He, he would get out of his evening coat and get out of his starched shirt and collar. He would take off his tie. He would put on very different clothing and he would go into the back of the home. This was in the late 18th century. In the 19th century, another man, very fascinated with humanity, but not fascinated so much with the human body, but fascinated with the human mind, and, and, and seeing in himself a dark side that he had written about ever since he was a teenager. Robert Louis Stevenson knew the story of Dr. John Hunter by day and Dr. John Hunter by night, and he translated that into a story that has become a fixture of the English canon, the strange tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, that was based upon a real doctor, Dr. John Hunter, and it was based upon real events that took place in the home of Dr. John Hunter. But Robert Louis Stevenson had a, a, a deeper concern. We would identify it as a theological concern. It's one of the concerns that haunted Stevenson throughout his entire life. It's a refrain that comes up story after story after story. It's the question, how can humanity be simultaneously so capable of good and so attracted to evil? Now, unfortunately, most Americans know the strange tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by some kind of synopsis or some kind of animated presentation or some kind of movie. If you've read the tale, the novella, you know that it's actually a story that is related by one man to another about what he had heard, about what had been taking place. And he told of Dr. Jekyll. And, and, and like John Hunter, Dr. Jekyll is one of the most esteemed physicians of, of, of London. And now th this was fast forwarded into the Victorian era, out of the, of the 18th century into the 19th century. But Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about Dr. Jekyll, and, and he's just Mr. Dr. He wrote about Dr. Jekyll, he's just Dr. Hunter, updated into the times of Robert Louis Stevenson. Again, everyone in the elite of London wants him as their attending physician. But what they don't know is that Dr. Jekyll has a fascination. There's, a, there's something inside of him. There's something inside of him that he says no to. He, he keeps saying no to until he stops saying no to what was coming from within him. As a medical doctor, as a physician, he had an acquaintance with, uh, with chemicals and with pharmaceuticals. And, and the way Stevenson tells the story, Dr. Jekyll begins to experiment with potions who will transform, which will transform him in, into someone else. And eventually he achieves a potion that will transform him not now as Dr. Jekyll, but instead as Edward Hyde. And, and, and Edward Hyde is everything he is not. And, and, and by the way, it's, it's a total transformation. Ed, Edward Hyde is actually, as Stevenson depicts him, younger than Dr. Jekyll. And uh, all, all kinds of Freudian analysis has gone into that as well. But it, it, it basically is the dark side of, of Dr. Jekyll, perhaps a dark side that he had been repressing since he was a very young man, such that Mr. Edward Hyde is a very young man. Now remember, this is taking place at the same time that crime is becoming endemic in London. 
the Industrial Revolution has happened and urbanization is taking place. There are hordes of people moving into London. This is the, this is the London that Dickens will speak about of the dark satanic mills. And, and with the urbanization and with all the workers and, and, and with the underclass, as it was then described, that was emerging in in London, there, there was a, an endemic of prostitution and venereal disease and all kinds of things, including murder, the most famous of which, the serial murders, are attributed to a man known as Jack the Ripper. Well, as Stevenson tells the story, Dr. Jekyll, experimenting with these potions, is able to transform himself as a pattern into Mr. Hyde. And, and once he is Mr. Hyde, and there you have the front of the house and you have the back of the house. You have Dr. Jekyll and you have Mr. Hyde. And you have Mr. Hyde in precincts of London where Dr. Jekyll would never go. Where the kinds of things happen that Edward Hyde wants to be a part of. And, and he is a man of evil and violence unleashed. And, and, and you know the story, or at least the general outlines of the story. You, you know that it required a different potion to, uh, to transform Mr. Hyde back into Dr. Jekyll. And, and you understand the crucial turning point in the story when that, that, that potion begins to be ineffective. The great moral turning point in the story is, is where Dr. Jekyll, having been transformed into Mr. Hyde, is, is only partly transformed from Hyde back into Dr. Jekyll. And, and he still has the body of Mr. Hyde, but he has the eyes of Dr. Jekyll. And passing a glass, a mirror, he sees with the body of Hyde, but with the eyes of Dr. Jekyll. And he says, this too was myself. That's the truly frightening thing. That, 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 that's what Stevenson came to understand. This was the obsession that had so concerned Robert Louis Stevenson even earlier in his life. It's reflected in his very first attempt at writing a short story. The, this too was myself. How can I be two people at the same time? How can that be possible? How, how can it be possible looking at humanity writ large that, that someone can be capable of such good and then the same person capable of such evil? It, it's, it's almost surely not an accident that Robert Louis Stevenson began to have these concerns in adolescence because it, a part of the achievement of adolescence is complex analytical reasoning. It's, it's complex cognition. It's the ability to, to see oneself and to analyze oneself. That's a part of the, of the trauma of adolescence, of the identity crisis of adolescence. Every single human being has to grow into adulthood through that period of adolescence. And you know, the, it, it, there's a very real sense in which we as Christian theologians understand that we don't resolve the identity crisis of adolescence. We just get busy. We just get busy. The reality is this too is myself. Now, in turning to Romans chapter 7, I fully recognize I, I have opened a can of worms. I have entered into a long-standing theological debate. I am very well aware that one of the New Testament scholars I most respect, Dr. Tom Schreiner, has written saying that we should not see this as the Christian's experience. I can also remember his faculty interview now more than 20 years ago when this was the text that was raised by then members of the faculty to ask him about his interpretation of the New Testament. In an article published for the Gospel Coalition, Dr. Schreiner begins by saying, don't worry, basically, this is not about the Christian. But at the end of it, he says, that is not to say that the Christian doesn't face this kind of struggle. There, there are basically two, there are more positions, but there are only two really legitimate positions in understanding this text. And, and, and the, that is either this is referring to Paul's pre-conversion experience or to his experience as a Christian. Those are the two basic uh, options here. By the time Dr. Schreiner gets to the end of his article, he, he, he basically says that he believes that this is not referring to Paul's present Christian experience because of the sense of total defeat that Paul registers here. 
And so as you look to the text and as we see it, we can see this total defeat that the Apostle Paul seems, seems to register here at the end. Because Paul concludes, if we consider the conclusion at the end of chapter 7, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. But let's look backward before we try to solve this puzzle. Let's look backward in chapter 7. You'll understand that the background where we began reading the text is Paul understanding the righteousness of the law. The, uh, the, the gift of the law. This is, this is after, in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following, Paul has made very clear the doctrine of justification. He's defined the gospel. And uh, we, we are told that what the law and the prophets were unable to do, although they are witnesses to what God has done, God is now in Christ, put forth Christ as his propitiation demonstrating how he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. One of the questions Paul is clearly answering in the book of Romans is, well, how should Christians view the law? And, 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 and Paul has two messages, and, and they're not at all contradictory. They are absolutely the essence of the gospel. His first message is that the law kills. And his second is that salvation doesn't come through the law. It comes only through Christ. But, but holding both of those truths and, and, and making very clear that the law kills and that salvation can come only through Christ, never through the law, he does not want us to disparage the law because as he makes clear that the first role of the law is to point us to our need for Christ, which the law does by slaying us. The law kills all of our pretensions. The, the law is righteous because it is the gift of a holy and righteous God. The law, the law is in this sense good. And we should be very thankful that, that God has not only given his law, his, uh, his, his law by special revelation and the Ten Commandments and in everything revealed in Scripture. We should be extremely thankful that God has implanted his moral law in creation where by the witness of that moral law, there's a restraint upon evil without which we would simply destroy ourselves. The specificity the Apostle Paul points to is right down to the commandment that indicted him. Thou shalt not covet. He said, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. In verse 8, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. There's more here than we can cover in such a sermon as time provides today, but th th this is one of the horrifying experiences of the Christian life. We, we read the law of God and we understand the more we read the law and the more we understand it, the more we understand ourselves to be lawbreakers. The more we come to understand the law, the more we come to understand that we have been breaking laws from the time that we were born. We have been doing violence to the law of God ever since we have been able. And in one sense, we understand the human timeline and the very sequences of human development as developments along a line of greater opportunity and manifestation of sin. We become more clever in our sin. We become more complex in our sin. And, and the, thus the Apostle Paul makes very clear the law is a gift. The law of God is not to be disparaged because if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet, he says, I would not have known that I was coveting. The language here is very interesting. Sin, seizing the opportunity. I, I was talking to a parent some years ago, and uh, the context was homeschool. And uh, the, the, the parent, the, the, they had lots of kids. It was, it was like uh, eight children. And the oldest was about 13. And, and thus they were having to kind of rethink some of their homeschooling philosophy. And, uh, and, and, and so the, the 13-year-old boy now, uh, and, and the homeschool, you know, they're, they're having to, this is one of the challenges of being a teacher, by the way. You've got to stay ahead of your students, which is, is easier when they're in the second grade than when they're in the eighth grade. Things get more complex. 
And, uh, and, and that's when just about every homeschool parent has to call for help. <laughs> we, we need a homeschool parent who knows algebra really, really well. Uh, we need backup. And, 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 and so this was a conversation that was going on. But the specific thing they wanted to talk to me about was introducing their children to sin. Now, that may sound like a strange thing, but that's actually otherwise what you would call reading the Bible. Uh, you know, just how carefully do you want your children to read the Bible? I've told many people that uh, one of the strangest experiences in my life was when I was 13 and my Sunday school teacher challenged me to read through the Bible. So I just started reading through the Bible beginning in Genesis. That's the way I started with any other book. And I showed up at breakfast one day before school, the oldest of four children looked at my mother and just asked a question that came as naturally as any other question I'd ever asked my mother at breakfast before school. I simply said, mom, what's a concubine? And, uh, and, and, she, and, 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 and every 13-year-old boy in this room, or anyone who ever was, has been, you, you know exactly what I'm going to say. When you got, I got that look, which is when the 13-year-old boy has no idea what exactly he's done wrong, but whatever he's done is thermonuclear. It's, this, is, this is just one of those looks. And, and then she said those words no 13-year-old boy wants to hear when, when she just said to me, um, your father will discuss this with you when he gets home. Oh, oh, good grief. What am I, I was reading the Bible. How much, how, how much trouble can I get into reading the Bible? My Sunday school teacher told me to do this. And by the way, I'm a thousand times more interested in what a concubine is. Given mom's response this morning, whatever it is, if it's gonna require a walk and talk, it's big. It's big. It's big. And of course it is big. And, and do you exactly want to talk to your 13-year-old son about a concubine over oatmeal <laughs> with little brothers and sisters with big eyes waiting to find out what a concubine is? Vocabulary word for the week. <laughs> No, no, but, but this is the thing. The, 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 the more you read the Bible, the more sin. This family came to me and they said, you know, we're just trying to think this through. Maybe you can give us some assistance. We, we don't want our children introduced to a lot of sin before they're ready. And I thought, oh, that is the stupidest statement I have ever heard in my life. I get it. I, I do get it. I get it. But it, it's not that you don't want to think they're not ready. But what scares me is when do you think they're ready? I'm not ready for this. I don't need to know what a concubine is when I'm 59. I sort of do, but you know what I mean. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got to know that thou shalt not. Let's be clear about that. But when, when you look at this, you all of a sudden realize I, we walk around with even a knowledge of things. Frightening knowledge of things. A frightening knowledge of things evidently God wanted us to have because he revealed it in his inspired, inerrant, infallible word. I'm not sure a 13-year-old's ready to know many of the things in the Bible. I'm not sure I am. But I know it's God's gift. And I know it's God's word. And I know that the law is good. And, and there are several uses of the law. If we had time, we could look at this. But the most important thing for us to recognize is that Paul understood that when the law indicted him, he had no hope but Christ. He speaks of sin seizing the opportunity, but he speaks of a struggle within himself. And, and it's, it's a struggle that is so important for us to understand. He says, I, I do what I don't want to do. I don't do what I want to do. And, 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 and there's despair in this. And, and this is where, and I appreciate Dr. Schreiner acknowledged this in his article, whether or not Romans chapter 7 is speaking of someone's pre-conversion experience or their post-conversion experience, the reality is that Christians struggle like this. And, and we need to look each other in the eye and say, we struggle like this. We, we, we struggle in the same way. The scariest thing in the world is the individual I meet in the mirror. And, and if you're honest, the same thing is true of you. When you look at the strange tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, 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 the most horrifying reality is there is no resolution Stevenson didn't have any resolution. He didn't know any resolution. How, how, how do you end this? Therapy's not going to be rescue here. You, you can't take Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde and, and just enroll them in therapy and think that's going to help. And, and clearly, the, the, the Victorian uh, fascination with potions, you can just translate that into our 21st century fascination with pills. 
That's not going to liberate. It is true that if we consider chapter 7, the end of an argument that there is no victory, there is no salvation, Paul asked the question when, when he speaks of his predicament, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Isn't that interesting? It's a who. A, a who? Who shall rescue me from this body of death? And, and then he says very quickly, as you see in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that sounds like victory. But then these next words, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Well, it sounds like we've gone from defeat to victory to defeat. Or assuredly not. And, of course, we remind ourselves, Paul did not write Romans in chapters and in verses. He wrote Romans as a letter. And so we dare not stop at the conclusion of chapter 7, but rather we reread, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is now, now therefore... There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so we conclude. I don't know that we can ever fully answer whether this text in its historical context and in the flow of Paul's argument is about the pre conversion experience of the Christian. That's what many of the early church fathers thought. Or the ongoing experience of the Christian. That's what the reformers in general thought. But the reality is we have to end up understanding that what we must not ever assert is that there is no victory for us because that's a repudiation of the gospel. And what we simultaneously must never forget is that we cannot deny there is a struggle for us, a continuing struggle as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But before our conversion, there is nothing but defeat. And before our conversion, there is nothing but ignorance even about who we are. There's nothing but darkness, despair. There's no hope. We are trapped within ourselves with no hope of rescue. But then comes the gospel. The gospel that promises us salvation from sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. A, a gospel that promises us glorification. That promises to us in this life progressive sanctification by the word and by the spirit. But also makes very clear to us that as believers... We are still in a struggle against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. And the scariest thing in the world is ourselves. But that's not the end of the story. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Robert Louis Stevenson didn't know that and couldn't end there. We do know that. And we can't end anywhere else. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we ask that you will bless the preaching of your word and that you will, by your spirit and by your word, by the indwelling Christ, give us every single day greater victory as we pray to be made more holy, sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ and by his gospel until Jesus comes and until we are glorified. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.